Alice Slater is the New York Director of the New Age Peace Foundation, a member of the Global Council of Abolition 2000, and on the World Beyond War Coordinating Committee. Alice Slater. Uh, actually, my, the end of my speech is how the, the baloney about the, the Putin bashing and how we actually got to that. And my beat these days is banning the bomb, banning nuclear weapons, and if we don't have a good relationship with Putin, forget about it. There are uh, 15,000 nukes on the planet, 14,000 are in the U.S. and Russia. All the other countries, there are nine altogether, I'll go through it, it's England, France, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea, the latest new baby on the block. All of them have a thousand. So it's really up to us and Russia to ban the bomb. And there's been a very uh, extraordinary occurrence. Last week, I was at the UN every day for a whole week. There's a group meeting that was created by the UN General Assembly that works with majority vote, no super votes, no vetoes, to create a treaty to ban nuclear weapons and prohibit them. Believe it or not, they've never been prohibited. We have a treaty to ban chemical weapons, a treaty to ban biological weapons, we did landmines, we did cluster bombs, which Hillary voted against. And we never ban nuclear weapons because we have this, it's, it's like the arms control equivalent of Obamacare. It's called the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And it was signed in 1970. And five nuclear weapon states, US, Russia, England, China, and France, promised to make good faith efforts to give up their nuclear weapons and the rest of the world promised not to get them. Except India, Pakistan, and Israel, they didn't promise, so they got them. And this Faustian bargain to sweeten the pot and get everybody to say they weren't going to get nuclear weapons, we gave them, and this is the language of the treaty, an inalienable right to peaceful nuclear power. I mean, inalienable right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and peaceful nuclear power. <laughs> what is that about? And of course, every peaceful reactor is a bomb factory. I mean, that's North Korea was a member. They got their peaceful nuclear power, and they walked out to make their bomb. And uh, that's what we were upset about with Iran, you know, which we were really, that was a very good anti-imperialist movements in America where we didn't let the country bomb Iran. I mean, there was a lot of grassroots pressure, and Schumer monster, he voted to bomb Iran, so we're New Yorkers, you know, keep that in mind. Um, anyway, so here it is. They signed the treaty in 1970. There's still 9,000 bombs on the planet. Obama's con con uh, committed to a trillion dollars over the next 30 years for two new bomb factories and new missiles, bombers, uh, and submarines, delivery systems. So obviously something's wrong. And in 2000, well, anyway, like four years ago, as a result of a, of a big statement by the International Committee of Red Cross on the humanitarian, catastrophic humanitarian effects of nuclear war, there were a series of three meetings in Oslo, in Mexico, and in Vienna to look at the catastrophic consequences of nuclear war, the humanitarian effects. And this altered the public conversation because up till then, they were talking about security, we need it for our security, you know, and I, I read this wonderful thing, I want to give you a quote from this uh, Elliot Sperber, he's a writer, he came to a Code Pink meeting yesterday and just like, handed me the perfect quote thing for us. He's talking about security because what we had here now, like we shifted 
the the uh, the paradigm. It's no longer security about nuclear weapons. You know, they said we need it for our deterrence, but now it's about the humanitarian catastrophe. That's what people are talking about, and even the Pope Francis sent a message to the Vienna meeting, and again last week, because the Catholic Church had an exception always for deterrence. And the International Court of Justice said, well, we can't say if they're always illegal in the very case where the very survival of a state is at stake, we're not going to judge whether they're illegal or not. So into this legal gap came the ban treaty. With these three meetings, we wound up the UN General Assembly voted to have these negotiations, and last week was a week of negotiations, picketed by all the nuclear weapon states. Now, what was interesting in the October vote, uh, you know, the Western states and Israel voted no, but India, China, and Pakistan abstained, and guess what? North Korea voted to ban the bomb. I'm sure you saw that front page New York Times. <laughs> so anyway, but I think with Trump, was it's been so nuts. You know, China was afraid he was going to recognize Taiwan. I think so. They all none of the nuclear weapon states came, and Trump's new uh, Madam Secretary of State, which gives a, a, a bad name to women. <laughs> She stood outside the conference on the opening day with the doors shut, flanked by the ambassador from England and the ambassador from France, and said, we're boycotting the meeting. And 132 countries are in there negotiating. I mean, like, this was terrific. Oh, and she opened it up, I'm a mother. So I need bombs, you know. Anyway. And, you know, we have to look at what this woman's thing is. The New York Times had a women's section this Sunday. Anybody see it? They featured Hallie, Nikki, this Nikki Hallie, you know, the, the nuclear bomber. <laughs> How women are making progress. And they had women from different movements. Not one from the peace movement. I didn't see Medea Benjamin there, you know. I didn't see Phyllis Bennis in the, they were featured, or jo jo Joanne, they were featuring, you know, famous women that took big roles in, in key issues in the United States. Nothing about peace. We had to actually fight to get peace into the climate march. You know, when we're talking about putting everything together and the store, we couldn't get it in. So anyway, back to the UN. It was the most incredible thing I've ever done. I've been going to these UN meetings since 1995 when they renewed the MPT and they lock the doors, they keep all the civil society in the halls while they're negotiating so you don't know what they're saying. You know. Well, none of the nuclear weapon states were there, so we had 132 countries, a lot of leadership from Mexico, Austria, Ireland. By the way, Ireland, <coughs> just announced that nothing the government ever invested is going to be fossil fuel. The whole country. That was yesterday I read that. So there's this, this stuff happening, you know, somehow, in spite of everybody. And uh, it was wonderful. Like, we had back and forth dialogue. You know, usually they gave us, you know, a half hour, NGOs made their statements. <coughs> NGOs is a non-governmental organizations. <laughs> it's an acronym. But anyway, so the, the citizens were talking back and forth and trading ideas and they're going to meet again in... Uh, oh, and the chair was a wonderful woman from Costa Rica, the ambassador from Costa Rica. And they're going to meet again the last week in June, first week in July, and they expect to have a treaty. They took all the input and she's going to do a draft and they're going to come back and they agree on almost everything. I mean, there's questions about if the nuclear weapon states want to join, do they have to give up their weapons before they join, or can we let them join with a time frame? You know, when to, you know, there's these kinds of things that they're discussing. But basically, we're going to ban the bomb, which is wonderful. Um, I just, in terms of uh, Martin Luther King, he he spoke about uh, nuclear disarmament. I mean, he he said some fabulous things. Uh, in 1957, 
I definitely feel that the development and use of nuclear weapons should be banned. See, so we're doing it, Martin. It cannot be disputed that a full-scale nuclear war would be utterly catastrophic. Hundreds of millions of people would be killed outright by the blast and heat and by the ionizing radiation produced at the instant explosion. Even countries not directly hit by bombs would suffer through global fallout. This is exactly what we were learning in this humanitarian conference. All this leads me to say that the principal objective of all nations must be the total abolition of war. War must be finally eliminated or the whole of mankind will be plunged into the abyss of annihilation. And then in 1959, just five months after he was stabbed in Harlem, he addressed the War Resistance League, uh, 36 annual dinner, he praised its work, and linked the domestic struggle for racial justice with the campaign for global disarmament. Not only in the South, but throughout the nation and the world, we live in an age of conflicts, an age of biological weapons, chemical weapon warfare, atomic fallout, and nuclear bombs. Every man, woman, and child lives not knowing if they shall see tomorrow's sunrise. And there were other statements. I mean, he really got it. And in a sense, what we've done now is change this conversation from we need him for our security, we need him for our deterrence. You know, the fear factor, the security. Um, did I read the quote to you yet about security that I picked up? Okay. Yeah. This guy, Elliot Sperber, that I met at Code Pink, here's what he wrote about security. The contradictions intrinsic to the concept of security are reflected in the word security itself, derived from the Latin se cura, or without cure. Security can be understood not only as freedom from care, worries, or attention of being carefree, but also as being careless. <laughs> and it is only one of several ironies that carelessness, failing to pay sufficient attention to or care for one's surroundings, tends to produce conditions inimical to well-being or safety. So the whole word security is like we gotta, you know, like mark it. That it's, you know, and that's what we saw with the Iraq and terrorism I and mean, code pink which I love to uh, work with, uh, you know, when they were warning, code orange, code yellow, code red, you know, danger, danger, they were saying, we're code pink. Thank you, Alice Slater. Uh, again, my name's David Swanson. I, I want to go back to one thing that Amit said when he was first up here, uh, which was that World War I gave us the, the model for war propaganda. You know, I think lies about war have existed as long as wars have, but the whole package uh, of U.S. war propaganda really was created uh, for World War I. What I talk about in my book, uh, War is a Lie, uh, started there with, with Woodrow Wilson and his crew and the Four Minute Men. Raise your hand if you know who the Four Minute Men were. One person. Uh, it, it took them four minutes to change the reels in the movie theaters, and so they would have some jerk get up and talk for four minutes about how evil the Germans were and what saints the poor Belgian children were and why we needed war and Jesus wanted you to kill. And you know, the whole demonization and racism and use of religion and the fear mongering and the glorification of violence and the, the narrowing of options. I mean, the whole package was there. Um, the, another thing that World War I gave us, of course, was the carving up and the British and French and, and subsequently US colonization of the Middle East, uh, which has mm -hmm. just done so much good for the world all these years. Uh, <laughs> another thing that World War I gave us was the incredible abuses of civil liberties, right? It wasn't just the, the effective propaganda. If you spoke against the war, you went to prison, mm -hmm. right? And the, the Espionage Act that, that, that President Obama was so fond of using against whistleblowers, the ACLU and the other groups that have worked for civil liberties, although they will not touch opposition to war or military spending or the things that since World War I have taken away those civil liberties. All of this dates back to World War I. Um, 
I, I was just reading on the train uh, up here, which I had a couple extra hours on. you got to love the infrastructure of a nation that spends all its money on wars. Uh, I was reading a book called In the Shadow World by Andrew Feinstein, who looks at this uh, you know, model weapons profiteer named Basil Zaharoff, who apparently, according to various accounts, you know, World War I was sort of triggered by an assassination in the Balkans. The Balkans was sort of kept violent and chaotic from the late 18th century right up to, or 19th century, right up to World War I, uh, because this guy would go and bribe editors and bribe border guards to fire shots and stir up incidents and bribe governments to buy more weapons uh, and sell weapons to both sides. Just, you know, the, the model of what the U.S. does today. Most wars in the world today have U.S. weapons on both sides, and in some cases more than two sides. Um, so, you know, this too comes from World War I. Uh, which comes first, the weapons or the wars? usually has a very clear answer. It is the weapons. Uh, a good thing that came out of World War I that we have forgotten is the incredible peace movement, not just that people were right beforehand and people went to prison and people suffered and people created models of resistance and, and other movements and the civil rights movement, but the incredible peace movement that came right after World War I that was you know, stronger by far than anything we've seen before or since in this country in, in many ways, including the movement against the war on Vietnam. I mean, it was just so mainstream, so overwhelming. The people who believed that war to end all wars propaganda and the people who never did were all united on let's make it true now. Let's end war now. Let's have disarmament. Let's have peace negotiations. Let's have uh, you know, let's actually make some good use of lawyers. Uh, I understand the, the criticism from Joanne that, you know, law alone isn't going to fix everything, but the idea that better laws rather than worse laws could do some good. Let's ban war. Let's make it criminal. Because World War I was not criminal. War was treated like the weather, as if it just happens, right up through World War I. And a lawyer from Chicago said, let's change that. If we're going to ban dueling for settling individual disputes, <laughs> let's ban war for settling group disputes. And let's not just, you know, we didn't just ban aggressive dueling and keep the defensive, you know, humanitarian dueling. <laughs> let's ban the whole damn institution, right? And so this was what I wrote about in a book called When the World Outlawed War, because it did. Because in 1928, the, the world created the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which is still on the books, which bans all war. Um, in fact, it was... May, January 16th, 1929, that the U.S. Senate ratified a treaty still on the books that has made every war since that date criminal. The day before that ratification, Martin Luther King Jr. was born. Mm. Uh, I, I was looking at Martin Luther King Jr. dates uh, and, and comments. And when President Obama was president, the lawyer for the Pentagon was a gentleman named Jeff Johnson who publicly said that if Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were alive today, he would support all of the American wars. Actually believed this, apparently. The, the current Secretary of so-called Defense, James Mattis, uh, back on Martin Luther King uh, holiday this past January, gave a speech that said essentially the U.S. military was there before the Civil Rights Movement because when Lewis and Clark went to, you know, plot genocide, they allowed a slave that they brought with them to have a vote when they voted on whether to continue across some river. So don't talk to us about civil rights. You know. so, so, so on April 1st of this week, I published a press release from the Pentagon uh, announcing that they were creating a Martin Luther King Jr. award for their top recruiter each year. And a lot of people wrote back and said, ha ha, good April Fool's joke. And a lot of people believed it. Uh, and a lot of people will hate me for life now because they believed it. And then, you know, the sense of humor in this country has, you know, gone with everything else. But uh, it's, not, it's not far enough off to not be believable. Um, also today, in 1948, the Marshall Plan was created 
for Europe, to actually rebuild Europe. Because the, the other thing that World War I gave us, of course, was World War II. And the, the wise observers at the conclusion of World War I, looking at how it was concluded, said that's going to give you World War II. Some of them predicted it almost to the, to the time that it started. And after World War II, things were done a little differently. It wasn't punish the hell out of the losers. It was, first of all, prosecute war as a crime under the Calabrian Pact. Do it one-sidedly, just prosecute the losers, yes, but prosecute it. And number two, build up the losing countries. Help them out. Don't push them into the next world war. And, and that, co that the cost of the Marshall Plan, the cost of actually helping people out after destroying their country, uh, minimal compared to what the United States now puts into destroying numerous countries around the globe. Minimal cost. Um, the, uh, the thing about, you know, I mentioned civil liberties being damaged by World War I, but this, this is what we've started looking at with this group, World Beyond War, that this website is up here, is the costs not just of a particular war, but of the whole institution of war which includes the costs to the natural environment. It is the single biggest destroyer of the natural environment. The costs to human rights, biggest violator. The financial drain, right? It, it would cost something like 3% of the US military budget to end starvation globally, including in Syria and Yemen and the places we hear about. Uh, you know, tiny percentages to end various diseases and lack of clean drinking water, et cetera. So the top way in which war kills is through the, the diversion of resources, not through some particular weapon. Um, and, and so we're working on a number of, of campaigns that we can talk about. One is getting cities and states and counties and towns to pass resolutions opposing Trump's proposal, which is to take $54 billion out of everything else almost, and put it into the military. To take military spending up above 60% and with a supplemental bill up above 65% of discretionary spending, where it hasn't been since, uh, since Reagan. And you know, it, it, it's very important that people say both sides of this, that we stop this nonsense of just opposing the things being cut without telling anybody where the money is going to. And you get opposition from the small government types, yay for cuts, right? <laughs> Until you explain to them that Trump has proposed the exact same budget as the previous year. Just wants to move money from everything good and decent into the military. And there's a polling company at the University of Maryland that doesn't just ask people questions, but tells them something first so they know what the hell they're talking about. Because most Americans have no idea what the federal budget looks like. So this polling group shows people the current federal budget and says, how would you change it? And the vast majority would move some 40 billion out of the military, meaning there's about a $90 billion difference between what the public wants and what Donald Trump wants, right? So if you were to take a random sample of the public and assign them to fix the budget or anything else, they always do a better job than Congress or the White House uh, and you know, would do a much better job if we let them. Uh, so a number of cities have passed good resolutions. Go to worldbeyondwar.org slash resolution, get the model resolution, adopt it to your city and pass it. We are working on building chapters in localities. We have a campaign working on divestment. It, it really is about the weapons profiteering. I mean, e even this Russia madness is quite openly Pentagon spokespeople are telling journalists it's for profit. It's for the profit to be gained through the Cold War. Uh, we have a campaign working on closing bases, one working on supporting international justice. Uh, we also have an online course that you can see a link there on the homepage that starts on April 10th, uh, so you still have time to sign up an online course on how to abolish war. Um, and I think Alice mentioned we pushed very hard to get the climate march to include peace, because there are always these Unify, you know, explicitly, we are unifying all movements. We are for everything good under the sun. We are for the climate and all of its intimate connections to labor rights and gay rights and everything, you know, that are all the good causes that have nothing to do with the climate. But not peace. But not opposing the single biggest destroyer of the natural 
environment. Uh, and so we pushed for that and won that as we always have to do. And so there will be a, a peace contingent, uh, you know, a rally and a march into the, the larger march and then a unified rally at the end of the big march in Washington, D.C. on April 29th and lots of buses from New York. Um, I, I want to mention as we, I was listening to, to all of this important history about resisting uh, the draft that there is still a big push on in Congress uh, by the Democrats to force every young woman when she becomes 18 to, like every young man when he becomes 18, register for the draft. Uh, and this is being treated not as an act of cruelty or enslavement, but as an act of defending the rights of young women against this brutal discrimination that denies them the right to be forced into a military draft along with young men. Uh, and it, that has to be pushed back against. Uh, and, you know, I, somebody will, I'll wait for somebody to give me the pro-draft uh, peace movement argument, uh, but there are 18 reasons why it's wrong, and I'll, I'll give you some of them. Um, uh, I, I also, listening to Glenn Ford, wanted to mention that I think the Black Lives Matter platform is part of the anti-imperial tradition that gets anti-war and peace activism you know, very much right uh, and better than these movements like the Climate March without having to be pushed into it. Um, and you know, so a, a lot has died among black and white and all other activism in this country, but there are uh, signs of hope there. Um, on the other hand, this question that Glenn said people were polled on uh, when you know, the president was a Republican, which I think was the key factor there, uh, of would you support a war that kills thousands of, of civilians? You know, in a presidential primary debate last year, a moderator asked a candidate, would you, as part of your basic responsibilities as president, kill thousands of innocent children? All right? And this was not a news story in any media outlet anywhere. Nobody blinked. This was just normal. This was just part of the U.S. enterprise at this point. You know, that question could not have been asked ever or anywhere else on Earth. Uh, and yet goes unnoticed. And that's something that's developed in, these, in this recent period, um, as has the, the damage done to the peace movement uh, under President Obama that I, you know, I'm not sure to what extent it's going to come back and whether it's going to take a new Trump war as opposed to Trump's continuation and escalation of all the existing wars uh, or what it's going to take. Um, but I, uh, I, I want to get to questions and answers.